Hello, everybody. Hello, and welcome back to the Astro Imaging Channel for this beautiful Sunday. Uh, tonight, Warren Keller is going to be joining us from West Virginia. He's going to be talking us um, talking about wavelets. Wavelets is one of the basic processes, one of the basic statistical mathematical processes that underlie a lot of the other processes in um, uh, PixInsight. And if you understand them and how to use them, it'll take you uh, forward in doing a lot of the other things you want to do uh, with PixInsight and your processing in general. If I could uh, start presenting here. Boink. That's Molly at our meeting. And um, I want to remind you all that we have a big screen here over on YouTube. And um, you've got a great place to ask questions over here. Just be sure to put a red question mark in there. It makes it easier for us to see it. Um, uh, if you put a big red question mark in there, we can see that you've got a question and it, it just makes it easier to follow along. Um, I also want to take you over to uh, the website. And here is one part of our website, Gorgeous Galaxies. We're up to about 30 galaxies, I guess. And remember, this is the link down here. Click here to submit the file. If you go to one of the other files, I, some people are sending them into the old address, uh, and and we we get it. I mean, we we can uh, forward it and so forth. But uh, this is the one that's keeping track of all the files that belong to the gorgeous galaxies. Um, the rules, such as they are, is that it be a JPEG or a PNG, or, you know, a nice picture, a big enough that it won't pixelate. And I, I'm calling that 1080 pixels on a side. You can send in a, a short movie, you know, a, a, a 10 second, 15 second clip maybe. Uh, although with galaxies, I don't know that there's a lot happening up in galaxies that you need to send a movie for. Make sure you tell us your name, email, equipment, and comments. We don't actually get to publish that, but it helps us learn uh, what people are doing and we might uh, be able to ask you further questions about it from there. Um, over on the homepage, you'll see that it's changed a little bit. Um, Stephen Miller's files are going to be moving because we can't keep them open here on the front page for a long, long time. Um, and they'll be moving over to the links section. In the links section, uh, we're going to be putting some things, um, well, with, with that there's no place else for that we want to keep along. One of the things that we're keeping in here, uh, this is the ethics survey that you guys have seen before. Uh, last week, we did a big show about ethics of astroimaging, and people asked if we could put the surveys out there someplace. And so we managed to get a, get a, a Word document that has everything that you want to know. So if you want to see what the document was about um, and all the results of that, they're still available on the links section of the astroimaging channel website. And I like always to review the calendar. We were, uh, Warren's going to be here today talking about wavelets. Graham is coming back next week. We were just talking to him before the show. Um, and he's going to be talking about 3D printing for astroimagers, you know, making those real attachments and uh, brackets and stuff like that. Uh, it really would help if we all had a, a custom replicator, fabricator that could make these things for us. And then we've got our usual collection. We've got May 30th opened again. It was it was filled for a while and then it's open again. Uh, and we've got, I think we're good up till about 4th of July. And we're going to take the 4th of July off because, hey, you guys should be out there blowing off fireworks. Even if, even if you're not in the United States, celebrate because it's always good to celebrate. Um, and... I want to remind you that we've got uh, Wanda's here tonight, and she's the one that's been keeping us up on this big uh, uh, spreadsheet. And this spreadsheet will tell you all the programs we've ever had on the Astro Imaging Channel. What is that? Getting up to be about 400 of them now. So we've been we've got a lot of programs out there uh, for everybody that uh, might know about 350 is probably a better guess. Anyway, uh, that's the introduction to the show. I'm going to turn it back. Remember to put your questions over here and any comments you've got. Uh, Warren, you awake back there in West Virginia, ready to go? <laughs> I am. I'm still awake. Okay. Well, then I'm going to stop sharing my screen 
and let you take over. All right. Let me, uh, presenting entire screen. Bada boom. Bing. Everybody see me okay? Yep. Now we can see your pics inside screen. Very good. Well, I'm going to tuck that away a second. And I'm just going to show a little tiny snippet here. But we're riding the waves tonight with wavelets. So what are wavelets, right? Um, they're signal processing algorithms. Uh, we'll find them in, in audio, in video, and, of course, apropos of what we do, photographic processing. Simply, um, these algorithms deconstruct a function or a signal, right, into different uh, scale components. So different sizes from largest to very smallest, right, and can be divided in, in, in different ways depending on what the author is or the, or the processor is trying to do. And, um, you know, in preparing this, this little uh, talk for you, it was like, wow, uh, wavelets just appear all over PixInsight. Let's look at this movie. Um, you know, in, in PI, when you save uh, any file format as a JPEG, you're offered option to save as a progressive JPEG, and Photoshop does that. And, and what's that all about? Well, let's see this movie for a second. Do you ever see a JPEG load on a uh, particular website? Um, and it actually loads in wavelets, the crudest, largest structures first. And if you got a slow connection, you can really see it happening. Whereas the picture comes into view as you start to develop those mid-sized structures and eventually those very uh, finest scale structures, if you look there. So let me just rerun that one more time. And um, that's just a great example of a progressive loading JPEG. But it's all about wavelets. Let's get the color in first. Sometimes you see just a square of color. Then you see those very large scale, uh, again, crude structures. Then those mid-scale structures starting to get sharper resolution. And finally, those, those very uh, sharp uh, resolution. So that's, that's really, from a mathematical standpoint, that's really all we need to know about what wavelets are. And if uh, we've been planetary imagers, perhaps we've used uh, Registax in the past, which had fabulous wavelet-based sharpening routine. Maxim DL uh, has wavelets, and I wouldn't be surprised if it has appeared in uh, other uh, Astro software programs. And in Photoshop, for those of us that are familiar with processing in Photoshop, the only thing that I know of that's wavelet-based in Photoshop is actually the sharpening tools palette developed actually in, in Israel. So it's, it's a wavelet sharpener. But Photoshop gets around that with um, right? the, the size of the, the pixels that we use, uh, kernel radius type of thing. But, but let's talk a little bit about, uh, about wavelets. Now, in the process menu, yeah, sure, there, there is a small submenu called wavelet submenu. And we see there something we'll be looking at a lot today, the MLT, multi-scale linear transform, which is the later and greater uh, wavelet uh, main tool in PixInsight. But also I'll remind you the older multi-scale median MMT, a very uh, similar looking tool works in a very similar way. Uh, and HDR multi-scale transform that we'll look at briefly. But again, as we're going to see, uh, wavelets are all over the place in, in Pix Insight. So the first thing I'm going to do is we've got a nonlinear uh, image that I stretched real quickly here of uh, Sunflower Galaxy, and I'll give creds to uh, Mr. Jim Misty, uh, taken from the legendary 32-inch uh, 
RC that was actually stolen out of uh, uh, Arizona many years ago, never been seen, never been found. <laughs> so if you have any information on that, contact me or, or Jim Misty. Uh, but we're going to look into the script menu. Analysis, uh, you've got something called the extract wavelet layers script and couldn't be a more simple, uh, simple direct name, right? We're going to extract wavelet layers. So we try not to confuse layer with the Photoshop layering system, which is a completely different thing. Wavelet layers are interchangeably uh, called uh, wavelet planes. And so layers are planes. And in the script, what I'm going to do is, and it's not necessary, I'm going to change the scaling function to three by three linear interpolation from the default uh, five by five B3 spline. And that's just uh, and anytime you see this scaling function in various tools, that's going to be better at getting to the smaller scale, the smaller sized structures. For this purpose, the default number of layers is, is fine, five, and, uh, and we do want to extract this residual layer. And we'll be seeing this R layer, this residual layer again. So I'm just going to click OK. Bing, bada, boom, bada, bam. Uh, what we have done is divided up uh, this image into separate uh, wavelet layer, wavelet planes. This one, as you can see, is the residual here in the uh, tab. And it's very large scale structures, isn't it? I'm going to close that. We'll move down to layer four. And we can see some bit smaller structures. And we're just going to move all the way down. Again, we're starting to see a little mottling in the background, perhaps more the fine detail of the galaxy. And that'll just keep happening as we go into these layers. And remember these numbers, right? Zero, two, zero, one. This is going to correspond to actually layer two when we get into a uh, MLT, multi-scale linear transform. But now we're really getting into the very small structures, uh, lots of noise, lots of uh, dark current there, and very small, again, fine structures in the galaxy. And finally, the very smallest in layer zero, zero, which again will um, relate to layer one when we get into a multi-scale linear uh, transform. So why do we do that? Well, it's a great exercise to kind of understand what we're talking about, whether we're doing noise reduction. You know, what scale are we trying to do that at? What size are those structures that we're interested in either killing because they represent noise or sharpening because they represent structure. Or when we get into the mid-size to the larger scale structures, contrast, right? Creating contrast between those different elements uh, of the image. Now, in my icon stack, and anybody that's been with me at all through videos or books or whatever, know that I love working from a chronological icon stack. And uh, it's just what it sounds like. It's pretty much a chronological order of things that I do in any particular process. Um, the very first time wavelets would come into play, uh, you happen to use uh, the subframe selector process, which is a, a newer version of the older subframe selector. Now, frankly, I don't use this because I love using uh, a version of this within the new weighted batch preprocessing script where it does the measurements for you, at least to the degree that, uh, that I find sufficient for my work. But know that there's uh, what's called MRS, uh, multi-scale, um, multi-resolution noise analysis going on every time we analyze uh, these light frames. So whether it's measuring here or measuring it in the weighted batch preprocessing script or even in the image integration process, 
is rather miraculously looking at every light frame in the stack, uh, breaking it apart into wavelet, uh, using wavelets into the first two wavelet layers to analyze how much of that small scale dark current noise there is in those images with that MRS uh, noise evaluation and thereby making decisions on which are the stronger signal to noise ratio, which is the lower uh, noise images so that we can use uh, really quality reference images to weight at, at the other images against the reference image. So that's the first time that that would come into play. And like I said, if you're using the uh, the weighted batch preprocessing script, oops, I clicked the wrong one. I had a feeling that was going to happen. Uh, if you're using this and you choose to here generate subframe weights, well, that's going to, again, use that MRS uh, evaluation to look at the first two wavelet planes or layers to determine uh, the amount of noise in each one of those, uh, those subframes. Okay, so... Let's look at uh, MLT, multi-scale linear transform. So that, again, that's the that's kind of the later and greater version of a wavelet tool. I'm going to reset that that little icon there. So that's what it looks like at defaults. And as you can see, by default, it's only going to generate four layers always generates a residual layer in addition to those four. Now, we saw that residual in that extract wavelet layer script, didn't we? Notice that uh, it's listed here as a scale of 16 pixels. So that residual is double uh, what the uh, scale in pixels of the previous uh, wavelet layer or plane is as eight, right? 16, then four, two, one. So Roughly what we're doing is we're going to have the smallest scale structures in that very first layer, which would relate to that double zero layer that the extract wavelet layer script generated. And then that O1 would relate to this layer two, very small, getting into the mid-sized stuff, uh, larger scale, and then residual. Now, sometimes we need more than those layers, depending on what we're doing, and we can increase those layers and still have that residual on the end. We can also turn layers off, and so we're literally turning those structures off uh, when we do that. Of course, MLT is typically used for two things, uh, noise reduction. Here, you see, it's capable of noise reduction per wavelet plane. It's going to operate on only those sized structures. And all sharpening in the same way, where in any particular layer, we're choosing to uh, increase the bias uh, to sharpen um, structures that we're interested in sharpening. And in doing that in combination with masking, uh, we can pretty much target about anything that we want, right? Because masks help us target in a brightness range way, mid-tones, shadows, what we're trying to accomplish. And the MLT, the wavelets, help us target by structure sizes. So in combination of the two, masks and wavelets, we can really get to about anything we want to do. Now, I'm going to double click my large scales down here. And what I did was I just made a heapo uh, big number of layers there going all the way uh, up to 1,024 uh, sized, uh, pixel sized structures. And um, I, I shut all of those off and I just, I, I'm going to allow everything below this uh, to, um, to generate. So let's just take a look at that real quick. So anybody that's ever used DBE, right, dynamic background extraction or ABE, automatic background extractor, to get that uneven field illumination out of an image, be it uh, vignetting that's post uh, flats, or maybe we didn't use flats, or they didn't do a great job of correction, um, or 
uh, just light pollution, right? Additive gradients, just gradient uh, ambient light getting into the field. But isn't this very reminiscent of what that type of structure uh, might look like? So that's why I say to folks, you know, when you're using DBE, you know, even though you don't want to do something silly like put put a sample on top of a legitimate mid-size structure, you know, we should bear in mind that this process is very wavelet based and that it's smart and that it knows what it's looking for. It knows that gradients, be it additive or multiplicative, right? Vignetting or light pollution type or just light trespass, that they're typically very large structures, very smooth, uh, uh, structures that don't rapidly change, that aren't complex, that aren't bumpy is a word that you might describe. But by the same token, we don't want to, uh, you know, risk uh, damaging a legitimate structure. So when I'm, you know, placing control points, I'm going to try to stay away from any legitimate structure. But I know that even if I get further into something, perhaps that I might uh, perhaps not, uh, should not have, the process knows what it's looking for. In fact, in, in this, in this um, sample here, and I like to use nice big samples, bigger is better, more pixels, more information, more data. Um, notice that the stars are blacked out. So again, via wavelets, it's looking at those small scale structures and saying, no, 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 I don't care about those. I'm not going to include them in any of the calculations. But I, what I do know is that I'm looking again for this large, smooth structure. And even with that minimum amount of points, if I was to apply that, you know, we, again, we would see something rather similar to what I demonstrated there uh, before. Looks like we've got some uh, very significant fall off there in the corner. But again, large scale, smooth structures, and that's what that's what gradient's all about, and that's how wavelets help DBE and ABE uh, do their thing. Now let's go over to small scales. And in this particular exercise, I found that I could really stay at the default four and uh, shut off, turn off all of the wavelet layers from two all the way up to the residual, right? Two pixels, four pixels, eight pixels, 16 pixels, and just generate uh, roughly one pixel size structures. And if we apply that to this image, and we're going to need to put a stretch on it, well, look at that. That's the heart of our, of our noise, right? And again, very, very smallest structures. So that's a little bit about about wavelets uh, there, large scales. So let's see. I'm just referring to a few notes here. Give me a second. Um, okay, so deconvolution. So some of us will employ deconvolution after we do our background modelization with ABE and DBE, right? Warren, and you have time you for one question? Yeah, absolutely. Someone made a comment, and I kind of agree. This has kind of the look and feel of doing high-pass filtering in Photoshop, doesn't it? Yeah, it really does. And again, you know, Photoshop bases most everything around pixel radii. So whether we're sharpening with unsharp mask um, or uh, the high-pass filter, it's a very close approximation of, of this. And 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 PixInsight does use that approach, kernel size, and pixel uh, radius in a couple of places. So good observation. And and again, not the most mathematical guy in the room here talking, but very very close approximation of the type of things that you see uh, with that. Okay, thank you. So deconvolution, right? Uh, very powerful tool, not necessary in all situations. Uh, frankly, uh, myself, Adam Block, uh, some others have, have recently discovered some problems with deconvolution. 
uh, ways to improve it, but that's a subject for another day. But notice we have some very advanced um, algorithms used for deconvolution. And the one that we use for deep sky type images is Richardson Lucy. And notice that it's regularized, right? So what does the regularization do? Well, look down here, wavelet <laughs> regularization. So once again, uh, as we'll see in MLT, you've got these wavelet, wavelet layers, very small stuff, pretty small stuff, a little bit mid-sized, right? Scale of four pixels, you notice in the pop-up there, scale of four pixels, scale of two pixels, one pixel. So it's very akin to what we've seen so far, eight pixels and, and 16 pixels. So what you can do with, um, with wavelet regularization and deconvolution, notice it, says, notice it says noise reduction. It's not really reduction, but it is suppression. And so what it's saying is, okay, and of course we're gonna use a mask too when we, de when we deconvolve. So in this case, I would have made a range mask uh, to protect um, you know, the background sky and the very dimmest weak uh, signal because I want to deconvolve, sharpen up, tighten up the stars and the detail in the galaxy a little bit. So I'm going to have the, the assistance of that mask, but at the same time, I'm also using wavelets to say, well, unless, unless um, you know, this threshold is met in that very first layer, you know, don't, don't deconvolve any of that. And you can see these descending, this would be the default, only the two layers, uh, the very noisiest, the very small scale stuff in the first two layers. But you'll see in my particular icon that I use, uh, I've kind of saved uh, my, fa my favorite uh, settings there. And again, these, these sets are available uh, through, the, uh, through the book uh, page at Springer, uh, if you're a subscriber to any of our, uh, of our sites. And honestly, just email me. I'll be happy to send you the very latest and greatest chronological uh, set that I use here. I'm always tweaking these with settings that I find better for the majority of data uh, that I do. But again, I'm addressing all the way out to the fifth layer because at least with CCD, you know, I'll see mottling and larger scale noise in that fourth layer for sure. And maybe, maybe in the fifth layer sometimes. And that's why, again, I've got these uh, a threshold and also descending amounts of noise reduction, which again, remember this really isn't noise reduction, it's noise suppression. So all it's really saying is, use wavelets uh, to determine um, what signal is strong enough to be deconvolved, to be, if, if you'll excuse the uh, word, sharpened. We know that deconvolution is really restoration, sharpening filter, but certainly the overall effect is uh, sharpening. So there's that. Used uh, the star mask process to create a, uh, a star mask. Notice we have growth uh, adjustments here, large scale, small scale, and just what it sounds like. So when we make a, a star mask, and I guess I'll just throw this at, at this image real quick, because I've got a nice peppy computer now I can do this, and create a star mask real quick. You know, these holes, these shapes that will help us either select or protect if they're inverted, right? I just inverted everything. <laughs> um, the growth of these structures will be affected by how much large scale or small scale we let it do. Now, of course, you can go to another process called morphological transformation, which we typically use to either shrink stars or shrink stars in a star mask or enlarge stars in a star mask, right? Because we want more protection to a halo or something, let's say. But once again, 
uh, you'll notice five by five circular structure. And um, I'm just arbitrarily throwing this at, at this just for demonstration. Let's say do, do three iterations. Let's say in, inst instead of morphological selection, I use dilation because uh, I want to enlarge these stars. Pretty subtle, but if I raise that amount there, and they're enlarging again. So there's wavelets rearing its head again all over the place in Pixon's site. Uh, the structuring element, and that's how we get smaller or larger stars uh, selected there. Let's look back at MLT, multi-scale linear transformation. So in my chronological stack, you know, I'm linear. I'm typically, if I'm working monochrome, I'm doing a channel combination here. I'm cropping the RGB and the luminance, let's say, or if I'm using one shot color, I'm jumping right here if I need to crop. And if not, I'm going to do my realization uh, with ABE or DBE color calibration. But before I stretch, before I do a nonlinear stretch, right, to, to go off to the races, and actually this is my nonlinear image. So just for, for safety's sake, let's pull up the linear image, right? I, I F12'd it. I canceled that stretch with this little icon here in the STF. And so it is indeed a linear image, right? Notice when I turn the monitor on there, that little icon, the little green arrow appears in the view identifier tab. So that's two, two assurances that it is indeed a linear image. But when I'm ready for noise reduction uh, with MLT, uh, that's why that icon is up top, up top there. And the very first thing I'm going to do is set my preview, my mask. And again, you know, I'm not. You feel free to ask any question you want tonight, because the intention was not to not to use the tools and process, but just to show you how many times P, uh, PI uses wavelets in so many different ways and how they're involved in the working of each tool. But if we you know, if we establish a mask, uh, we could do that with a uh, real-time preview. You know, adjust that mask accordingly. We would have eyeballed that image, really see, you know, where that where that noise profile stopped and started. Was the signal really strong here near the core? Where did it start to get kind of bumpy and modely? I would say we got kind of mid-size noise and don't be afraid to manipulate the STF to either brighten or dark and to be able to see what you're trying to see at any given time. And so when I do that, I see a little bit of modeling there in, in, that, in that pretty good strong signal. But as I get out to the background sky, and again, I'll brighten that up, we can really see the majority of the noise out in the in the background sky, that Gaussian noise looks pretty good. Salt and pepper, nice even distribution here at the kind of the the break of where the dimmest uh, areas of the dimmest extensions of the galaxy arms are. So that's what I like to mental snapshot by eyeballing the image like that. Don't be afraid to get in there to zoom in to adjust your STF because remember, image is linear. You're not changing it in any way. It's just a temporary. Uh, screen visualization. But once I've done that and I'm done previewing mask, watch what happens when I deselect the preview mask part of the show, <laughs> if you will. Now I've got my noise reduction settings up and don't they look familiar? I probably should have shown this uh, before uh, we saw it in deconvolution, but they're very akin uh, to those wavelet regularization that decon does, right? But remember, that's that wasn't noise reduction, but this is because notice for every one of these wavelet layers or planes, again, that layer two represents roughly two pixel scale, layer three, four pixels, layer four, eight pixels. Oops, I just accidentally turned that off. Um, notice that I've got a very similar scheme. You know, here's the threshold. Uh, here's the threshold setting. Considered noise, what should be considered signal. These settings work really well a lot of the time. And rather than worrying about changing the thresholds or even honestly changing the amounts so much, and notice that they descend as well because less noisy, 
less noisy as we get to larger scale structures. What I do is I just manipulate the iterations. How many times should that be setting be applied? So very little noise out here in the fifth layer. Like we said, maybe some larger scale model. A couple of iterations, see that two here, that two represented here, two iterations here, but now hitting pretty heavy on that third, uh, on that second layer, three iterations there. And in the very noisiest layer, well, you've got an option. Notice I did a real no-no there. You could use a pretty heavy noise reduction here, or you know what? It's very unlikely that you're ever going to see a legitimate structure at one pixel size, unless you're shooting with a 10 meter focal length or something like that. And so you can simply turn that layer off and it'll act in the same way as the noise reduction by simply killing, killing those structures. So uh, Warren, do you have a couple of questions that popped up? Take them sure. Uh, Jeff asked, what is convergence? Where, where'd you see that? I don't know. He posted the question. I know that convergence. Oh, conver convergence. You no, know, convergence is typically reaching the solution. That's that's anytime in deconvolution. Anytime you see it's in uh, TGV denoise. Anytime you see that's where the algorithm reaches the best solution. Okay. And another question from John. Will MSLT greater iterations minimize dark modeling in the background? All right. All right. So not MSLT. We're talking MLT here? Probably, yes. Okay. So say it again. Will, let's say MLT greater iterations minimize dark modeling in the background? You know, the general philosophy of any of the tools is better to do a couple multiple iterations than hitting too hard in any one iteration. Now, if you're really seeing model, um, you know, let's say with uh, some of the older DSLRs, we're very prone to that very large scale model. Uh, then you've got to use a combination of first educating yourself with that script, right? Uh, sorry, uh, duh. One more Give me one more chance. Uh, image analysis, uh, extract wavelet layers, run that, look at those structure sizes and, and identify, oh yeah, stuff resides. And and um, I, 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 I'm, I'm losing the word. And, and you want to relate it to what particular layer it's falling in over here with MLT. So again, this is typically going to be that very smallest Gaussian salt and pepper noise up here. And then as you get into that third and maybe fourth layer is that larger scale model. And so when I experiment and and honestly, you know, you can do this, you can use the real time preview down here. When I experiment, and you can now zoom in too, which is nice. And you can brighten this up, right, if you need to. But when I'm experimenting, I'm on the fly changing iterations to see the minimal amount of iterations that are going to get me a good result for any particular layer, the structure sizes that reside in that layer. Now, what I often tell people I work with or whatever, I'm not crazy here. The real-time previews are wonderful. Uh, but whereas you can only see before and after, before and after with a real-time preview, if you use a standard preview, which would be quickest way Alt-N, gather up some weak signal, some good strong signal, make sure we got enough of that background sky. If you're using standard previews, it's a bit easier to try particular settings on a standard preview, right? And I'll all, I'll control shift Z. Now it's going to be before and after, before, after. Well, let's say I think I'm a little heavy handed 
on the small scale stuff or the mid tone, mid sized structures. Well, I can easily create a new preview and clone the original preview, right? And it's now a virgin preview before anything happens. And so now if I say, okay, let me, let me back off the iterations. I'm, I'm getting over smooth now. It's looking unnatural, yada, yada, and, and, or I need more in the larger scale stuff. And then you can apply those settings and it's easier then to be able to toggle between two different um, standard previews to determine what your best uh, settings are. Uh, one more question. Sure. Chris asks, I'm not sure that you've covered this, but is there a way to get a false color image indexed by frequencies present at the point? That sounds like over my pay grade. <laughs> I'm not sure what the question is, really. Yeah, Chris can Chris can write me, and 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 between me and Ron Breacher, my much more mathematically minded training partner, we may be able to come up with an answer for that. All right, we're all set for now. Thanks, Ron. Okay, so I'm gonna delete those previews, and so you know, let's say down the road a little bit, we go back to our our nonlinear image, where'd you go? There you go. Okay, so that's, you know, noise reduced and, you know, has been stretched already. And I presume everybody's fairly comfortable with stretching. And if not, uh, we can, if we have the time, we can, we can look. But again, you know, I hope this is beneficial, but the, but the, but the focus of this was really to just show all the places that wavelets come into play uh, within Pixinsight. And, and again, not to show everything uh, of how to use the tools. You know, many of us would be familiar with HDRMT, uh, high dynamic range, uh, multi-scale transform, a very, very powerful uh, developer of detail in that it is a brightness range uh, compression tool. Uh, but look who's here, look who showed up. Uh, you know, wherever you go, there, there you are. Uh, number of layers. So this is another wavelet-based tool that, based on structure sizes that you select, uh, and it's got an internal mask, and it's going to go to lightness. So if this were a color image and it's not, it would target the lightness channel of a ab mode uh, color image. Uh, it would also have an internal lightness mask, which again is kind of smart in that it knows what it wants to do. It wants to compress bright cores like this. And again, if it is a color image, you, you also have this preserve U setting, which is a good thing. But, but watch what happens here. And six, by the way, six layers is just oftentimes just a magical uh, sweet spot for, for HDRMT, never used more than one iteration in my PI processing career, if you can call it that. It's a couple of different algorithms, the median uh, transform, and when that's not checked, it's the starlet, it's the old Atru wavelet, AWT, uh, and most of the time we are using uh, the Atru. Uh, the wavelets and wavelets. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry. The the Atru or the Starlet uh, algorithms are not prone to ringing. And if you're familiar with Gibbs effect ringing from deconvolution, you'll know what that is. So we typically don't uh, don't use that. But but it takes a little bit longer. But watch what happens as the old song goes. And so you know, this is one of the very first things that impressed the heck out of uh, out of me. Uh, with regard to Pix and Sight, again, look at that uh, that amazing compression that's going on there. Now, uh, a big mistake that you see on a lot of images posted today is just over compression. You know, I always think about uh, um, the great David uh, Mallon, um, the old astrophotography film. Uh, well, glass plate master back in the in the analog days, and he said, "Respect the light. 
So we like to keep natural contrast, you know, not make things too bright or too dark. And I see a lot of images that are just flat as pancakes because the core has been uh, overly compressed. And that turns out in this case, HDRMT doesn't have that fine tuning ability. It doesn't have that amount slider. So what I typically wind up doing is applying it that I like, cloning the image, and then backing up and adding that clone back at a reduced uh, amount to just get a little bit of that compression and that detail. And of course, if you'll notice, the stars are getting dinged too. And so that's one of the, the only drawbacks that I know about with HDRMT. You get this kind of donut effect with, with brighter stars. So typically you do want to either use a uh, an extra external targeted mask to just select your object of interest that you're trying to get that compression on, or a star mask, and even just a uh, just a bright star mask just to protect those guys. But again, if you go to uh, the smaller scales and you hit this again or use it initially, you'll see how very fast that's able to to do. And so you do have to watch it. But again, very powerful tool and uh, way to develop detail there. Uh, just quickly, let's return to MLT later in the stack. You'll see here for sharpening, SH there. And so now the tool is set up a little bit differently. Um, no noise reduction in any of the three layers that I'm interested in. And I've got a little bit of what's called bias. Uh, just think of it. If if these structures ref, uh, relating to about four pixel scale in that third layer, if I wanted to boost them a little bit, so right bias is kind of a, a skew to boost those those images those those structures a little bit, and I'm typically just in the third and the second, and if I'm working, you know, an image that's got high enough sampling that there could be or there, there is, you know, st legitimate structure as small as a single pixel. Well, let's see what this will do. I'll just kind of dim the brightness down. Oops. Well, this is my nonlinear image. Okay, so what, what, what you see is what you get. Uh, but actually, what we could do is just, even though it is nonlinear, we just dial that down a little bit and watch what, watch what happens when we apply a little bit of that bias, a little bit of that boost. Um, everybody see that okay? I'll do it slow. Before, after, before, after. And I always work subtly and I always work incrementally, but you can bring these up to anything you want. You'll notice that the slider will won't get you to where you want to go it'll stop at point one but you'll notice in my icon that i'll double click here i'm at point zero five uh, and so again you can type those values in to get finer uh, control than you can with the slider now another tool that's meant for developing contrast Instagram equalization. And this is one of the ones that I mentioned. Notice kernel radius. So this is not a wavelets based tool, but just like uh, Chris's question before about relating to Photoshop. And when I said unsharp masking, you're adjusting the, the structures based on the pixel radius of structures. This is very akin to that. And so you would use this to develop contrast. Again, I would always be using masks for this stuff uh, to target uh, just what I want to target. And I'll do multiple passes of this at different kernel radii, 25, 50, 100, to get the kind of results that I want. But again, a wavelet type tool, but not a wavelet based tool. Uh, we looked at morphological transformation and that structuring element uh, to uh, increase or decrease uh, star um, sizes. Convolution, you know, we often use the convolution 
uh, the convolution tool to blur things. And you'll notice that the standard deviation slider, that is indeed uh, standard deviation of the parametric low pass filter. Uh, so larger dimensional scales. So yeah, this is kind of a hybrid, right? It's not a pure, it's not a pure uh, wavelet tool, uh, but we use it to blur our masks, to make our masks smooth, uh, whatever we need do. So again, in conjunction with your brightness range masks, you can accomplish about anything you need to do uh, with wavelets. I hope that's made things a little bit clearer and not more convolved. <laughs> Actually, we have a couple more questions. They seem to be popping up on a regular basis. So uh, let me just read them. Uh, Rod asks, question, will noise reduction performed with wavelets generally undo sharpening performed with wavelets and vice versa unless masks are used? So, you know, I'm doing the lion's share of my noise reduction in the linear stage. And whether I'm using the internal linear mask feature of MLT or an external mask, sure, I'm targeting the background sky and the dim detail that need to be, the, the weak signal, sorry that need to be smooth. Later on, I'm using essentially an inverse of that mask, right, to target my highlights and my upper midtones to sharpen, and that's in the nonlinear realm. Uh, and so I hope that's clear. And another thing is, you know, remember smoothing facilitates sharpening. So what we want to sharpen is legitimate detail, right? Actual astronomical structure. Successfully do that until we attenuate the electronic stuff, the fake stuff, the non-astronomical stuff, the small scale noise. We got to get that out of the way. We got to smooth that left with legitimate size structures and then sharpen and add contrast to those as we process along. So noise reduction in the linear state mass so that you're working on dimmer areas and then sharpening in the nonlinear state on the brighter areas, which obviously right. have more detail. Right. Now, interestingly enough, MLT, if you look at it, um, well, let's just open it real quick from here. You know, there's nothing to say that you can't do noise reduction and sharpening in the same pass, but it's just not good practice. Because again, typically you're trying to do the inverse uh, to those masks that you have in place when you're doing that stuff. And Chris asked one more question. Can wavelets uh, applied against calibration frames be used to improve corrections? Um, not, that, not that I'm aware and not something that I would try to do. You know, we try to keep our calibration frames pretty pure, uh, the way they come off the camera, because uh, they have a lot of important statistical information in them, right? And other than a cosmic ray strike or something, we want a, a bias frame that's really indicative of the, of the uh, fixed pattern noise that's in the camera. We want the the darks to represent what's actually happening in that exposure time at that at that temperature. So I would to, again to my pay grade, and I am not the uh, the math guy. Um, it's not something I would use, and it's not something I'm aware of. Okay, those are our questions. Okay. Okay, thank you, Warren, for that excellent presentation. Um, it strikes me that we have some people that are watching out there thinking, wait a minute, how am I supposed to use all this information? Um, 
sometimes you just have to know what's behind what you're doing in order to understand what you're doing, how to use the tool. You know, a good carpenter will have to understand grain and wood before he takes his chisel to it or his saw to it. And the kind of presentation that we have tonight was not so much about how to use the chisel, but about the grain of the wood and uh, the, the, what a picture looks like when you break it down uh, mathematically. And I thought that was that was that will teach us a lot. And a lot of people got a lot. They said, oh, I didn't know you could use a preview for doing that. Um, it's always interesting to watch somebody else process a picture because you think that you know how everything works and you don't necessarily know how everything works. You find out stuff. Right. And as I've you know, said to many folks, as a teacher, you know, you feel compelled to know several, if not all, of the ways to do something. But as a user, you don't sweat that. You find something that's in, uh, intuitive to you, that works for you, and you stick with that because most times, you know, you can uh, use that. Now, I, you know, if you're kind enough to have me back down the road again, you know, we can do a whole walkthrough process and just watch how Warren does his thing. But, but again, as Alex said, I think even if you're even on a very shallow level, which believe me, when it comes to mathematics and algorithms, uh, th this is, th I'm your guy. <laughs> uh, I, I have a very basic understanding of, uh, of, of what the algorithm is, what it does, but I'm mostly using my eye and my creative sense to identify what structures I'm interested in, again, smoothing, sharpening, adding contrast to and where they live uh, in the wavelet planes to effectively be able to use those tools. And that's really it for me. Yeah, unfortunately, watching Michael Jordan make jump shots doesn't make us a better basketball player. So, I mean, I would guess that a good amount of the data that we're processing is somewhat unique and that you might attach that differently than you would your own data. So kind of a deeper understanding of how the tools work is very valuable in our own processing, no matter what. And on that note. Well, I'm going to speak to that. That's a tremendous book. It was a lot of work, but but it was published in February of 2019. And, you know, Sight is a rapidly moving target. It's rather frustrating <laughs> for me for anybody documenting it in its in its uh, in its uh, quest uh, to be the best uh, pi is constantly changing and it's uh, again a moving target and very hard to keep current with it so the book is really good but it's long in the tooth i'll 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 take the opportunity alex uh to give a shout out to my friend and uh, former partner Rogelio Bernal Andreo. He's got uh, Mastering Picks Insight and it's a great book and it's it's more recent than than my second edition is and and you know what again the moving target it's already going to there's going to be some changes there. I yeah. I have a contract for a third edition. I deciding whether to hang myself or to sign that contract but you know it, it it may happen. Warren, could you mention again how uh, someone might be able to obtain your your preset or pre-configured processes? Before you before you do that, I, I want to tell you that I, you know I I got some of Warren's tutorials earlier and some other people's tutorials, and I've looked on on the web, and there's a lot of good tutorials out there, and I butted my head against Pix Insight for some time, but. It wasn't until I downloaded the chronological uh, process icons from Warren that I actually could go through and, and actually process images reliably. Um, and uh, the, um, I, I just wanted to do a shout out on that. They, they really are an effective way to hold your hand, just going basically right down through the processes as you go. Um, now go ahead and tell them how to get a warrant. Well, I mentioned 
Is there, let me ask you this, Alex, is there some delivery method that if I sent them to the astro imaging channel <clears throat> that people could request them or download them rather than everybody? If you, if you, uh, I can put it on, uh, here, wait a minute. Um, Warren, are, Warren, are you still presenting? Stop, um, stop your presenting. No, he's, he's stopped stop. presenting. Okay. Um, I could put it, let's see, where am I? We, got, on we do page. have a section of our website called links. And we could put right there, we could say either links to wherever you want it, or we could put it on our own. Um, okay. Uh, we could put it on our own Google Drive. And just like the ethics and astroimaging survey, you want it, you go yeah. get it. Yeah, okay. fine. Yeah, I mentioned, you know, if you go to Springer and you go, you look very carefully for a very tiny link on the book page that says uh, extra material, uh, there's an older version of it there. If, and I'm trying to be really careful here, I don't want to do any commercial, uh, but if you are a subscriber to IP for AP or uh, Masters of Pixel Site, whatever, it's there. But I'm, again, I'm always happy to give folks my latest and greatest, my personal set. Uh, the, the differentiation is my personal set might have names for those icons that are more abbreviated than a customer set which I would kind of spell out the whole name of the tool, let's say, now, uh, so is it, for easier is it identification. A form of a, I may, I may. Is it in the form of a loaded a project that you load up, Warren? No, it's in the form of a uh, XPSM file, which you just, in, in PI, you just say load process icons, and, and it loads that set up. Um, yeah, I can I can show you how it works here. Well, I have to fire up Pix Insight and stuff, but um, one of the choices when you when you pull down processes is load process icons, and then you go out there and you can get an alphabetical list. Uh, you can get a uh, I've taken Warren's stuff and included my uh, um, weighted batch preprocessing. I've got a lot of the um, uh, calibration files already in there. And so my my um, action item set like that um, is already all ready to go when I when I just download that particular right. and, and you you know you start with a set, you you can rename icons, whatever you like. You can put descriptions in there, you can reorder them, you can physically move them and just save that set back out again. so it's your custom workflow set let me let me show you here um where am i i'm here i gotta go here and present now my entire screen and now i go over to pix insight come on wake up okay so you should be seeing my pix insight screen now if I go to process, process icons, load process icons. This is Alex chronological. That's Alex's chronological version of Warren's. Chronological is probably Warren's and it's uh, dated from 4420, maybe. New logical, see I've, I've saved them in, in various forms. This is the one I'm currently using. And I tell it to download that one, and it's got a date on it. So that's how come I knew it was the one I'm pretty currently using. And you can see it's got all this stuff in it. Oh, I messed this up today. Uh, there's my batch processing file, and as you can see, I've already got my bias darks flats lights. Uh, I have to add my files to it, and then I and as I go through the whole thing. And this is all an idea I stole. Well, I can't say I steal it because he's giving it away. But um, I can click on any of these things. And they're also in chronological order. You know, I this, this is basically the process I go through. Right in the middle someplace here is my transformations, my histogram transformation, the curve stretch, mask stretch, and, that kind and of stuff. 
just just wanted to say, and it, it it serves two very important purposes. A, if Alex will float over the the process uh, menu up top there. Which one? Please uh, take your cursor and just float on the process menu up top, the regular menu, the menu. There. Yeah. Go to all processes. So it keeps you from fishing around to, oh, my gosh, what do I use, when, what, how. But, but equally important, remember when I would double-click those icons and they would populate with different settings? Well, each one of these icons get refined uh, to your liking, you know, for your mm -hmm. data. And so you might have better starting points than if you open the process directly from the menu and start at the factory defaults. So that's the two really important things yeah. about them. Well, I mean, I know which camera I'm going to be using, and I know what it's going to need in, the, in a lot of those um, settings already. So I, I don't have to go over to process all processes and, you know, pick these things off. So that's 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 what they're just very, very. I mean, basically, you just go down through the list. And Warren's list is a lot nicer and neater than my list is. But then again, I know where everything is on my list, pretty much. I, I still get lost. I'm going to admit. OK. It's like uh, having Warren, a clean did, did we just, oh, messy desk. <laughs> Warren, did we just say that you were going to send me a copy of whatever it is you wanted, and I could put it on the yeah. our hard drive? OK. Yes. So we'll just put it in links on, on our hard drive. And you can download them as you see fit. Where are we, Eric? We got questions. I think we covered everything. I was looking back just now. Uh, as it oftentimes happens, your your presentations, Warren, raise more questions in the viewer, including myself. <laughs> <laughs> you said, are we doing this right? No, gee, it looks like maybe we got to rethink this. Uh, even after all these years, you still have to rethink this. <laughs> so what's the difference between loading a set of process icons and say a project? Um, so a project stores everything, right, by default. You can deselect and, and choose not to save everything, but it's going to save every image, every preview, every working image, every process that's open, the zoom and pan levels. It's a, it's essentially a system. And, and, the, and the histories, right? So you and, the, and the history. It's essentially a, a system snapshot of exactly the way you put PI away. And within a project, you can certainly save an icon set. Uh, but again, an icon set can simply be saved to itself rather than the... Uh, uh, the bundled uh, project uh, thing, you just save it, uh, save process icons, boom, and it's an XPSM file. And you can open PI directly from that that file, or you can, again, load it once PI is open. And you can merge icon sets. Uh, you can do all kinds of fun stuff. Can you merge projects? No. Uh, unless, no, no. You'd, you'd literally have to open open a project then open other images let's say put them in a separate workspace and then resave that project pat pat the horse has suggested that uh he puts them i i think he means uh, or pat i don't know if the horse say pat the horse pat the horse, <laughs> pat the horse. Pat the horse. Pat the um yeah, yeah, that's what it says. Um, put some in a process container and save that uh, as a startup project, less clutter. Yeah, if all you want is the processes. But it, it, remember what um, Warren said, you're also getting the files themselves with the file history. You can you can load a project, click on one of the program, on one of the uh, images in there, and you can undo the last thing you did last week before you save the project. Right, right. The process yeah. containers are great. If I work with somebody one on one, rather than try to transfer you a three gigabyte project, as long as you and I have the same files, I just send you a little teeny uh, 
process uh, container and boom, you've got all your settings that were used there, right? Yeah. But that history is so important to be able to go back forth to do to clone an image, to try new settings on it. It's very powerful. It's big, but it's very powerful. But remember, everybody does it different. Everybody's right. got That's their own little style of doing it. Right. I, I guess in the end, we need to clone you, Warren. <laughs> okay. Are we pretty much done? I think so. Yeah, I think we are. Then I'm going to thank Warren once again. Thank you. Enjoyed it. Okay. Next week, we're going to do 3D printing for those of you who want to figure out how to get adapters made and stuff. And even if you don't want to go all the way to investing and buying a 3D printer and all the doodads that go with it, and there are a lot of doodads that go with it, um, a lot of libraries and make it centers and you know things like that are available to you. And if you know that such a thing exists and it can be used, that's probably enough to get you going so that you can find out how to make those adapters and, and brackets and things like that that you might need. So come on back and Graham will be telling us about that next week. We are always looking for presenters. So please uh, present, okay? Volunteer to make a presentation. We've had some, at least once or twice, uh, once or twice a month lately, we've been having people among you volunteering to make a presentation. Please do that. We can use your help. Okay. Is that about it? Is it time to turn it over to the boss? Molly? All righty. Have a good okay. night, all. Thanks for coming. Thanks. Bye, everybody.